Uh, so last week we we started off what we're talking about, which is you know, if if we're going to call this series anything, it's going to be God's nature. And so and so we started off talking about God's nature, um, and we 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 kind of set everything up by examining okay, what what parts make up God the Father, or, or really God altogether, and then we talked about God uh, the Father at the end, and and so we asked the question, okay, so how do we relate with God? And we examined him to find out how we relate. And so, and, and so what I mean by that is he's three parts and he made it us in three parts. And, and so God the Father mirrors our soul, which is our decision-making faculty is the best way to understand it. And so your, your soul is, is, is uh, your mind, will, and emotions is how I've heard it put. And so if, if your soul is the decision-maker, then it would mirror God the Father because he is the decision-maker between the Spirit and the Son. And so now we come to the sun, and it's kind of funny because when I was praying, I was like, God, I really feel like we have enough information in week one to split it into like two or three weeks. And he's like, no, it's one week. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And then I came to the sun, and I started writing uh, my notes, and I was like, all right, I, th I think we can get this in one week. He's like, all right, we're going to make it two. So I don't, I don't know what his plan is, but uh, <laughs> he's got some sort of idea about what we're doing. So we're going to explore the sun over the next two weeks. And and so this week, we're going to talk about how we relate to him. But then next week, I, I had some really cool notes as I've been uh, reading through the entire Bible this year. Uh, as I was reading through uh, Numbers and Leviticus, I noticed how Jesus' sacrifice perfectly mirrors so many consequences and commands that you see in the Old Testament. And I, I won't cover them now. We're going to do that extensively next week. But it's, it's really phenomenal. And it's incredible how God, uh, preparing to save us from the very beginning, began laying out laws to go, hey, you know what, if, if, if someone murders someone, here's what you do. If, if you, you know what, you, you, once a year, the high priest is going to come into the Holy of Holies. That was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And so there was the temple, and then there was an inner kind of chamber in the temple, and that was the Holy of Holies. It was God's presence. And, and so it was understood that only one person could go there per year that was the high priest and he would make a sacrifice for all the people and it's incredible the way that god laid this out and the way that we get to see clearly that jesus fulfilled these things and you know we all are probably at this point should be familiar with the high priest and going into the holy of holies but there's so much more to that sacrifice um, and so next week we're going to go very in depth with that uh, but but this week i want to kind of help us understand uh, what is so important about our relationship with the Son? And why I believe that the best way uh, to have a godly marriage, the best way to have a, a, a proper relationship with Jesus is to understand it in this light of, of, of we're to marry Jesus and the rules that God lays out in the Old Testament specifically for women provide a perfect stepping stone to understand how we as the bride relate to Jesus. Okay, I, I mentioned this last week. I'll, I'll explain a little more today. Uh, uh, it, it's so important that we understand women in the Old Testament from a significant standpoint. So what do they represent? They represent the bride of Christ. Men represent Christ himself. Okay, so these are the representations that we hold. Okay, and, and what's so important about this is when you see a role given to a woman, you need to understand the idea is this is the role given to you in relationship to Jesus. And so often it's easy to read the Bible and go, oh, well, there's a big difference between men and women. Yeah, because that's what, why we have different roles, okay? Men have the responsibility, and really, it's not really the best responsibility. It's, it's, it's a high calling, but it's also there, there, there's a higher judgment. You know, the Bible's clear. There's, there's uh, uh, several different areas where in the New Testament you see God saying, hey, if you're a teacher, you're going to re receive a stricter judgment. Husbands, honor your wives, lest your prayers be hindered. And so, and so there, there's things in the Bible where, you know, you may see, you know what, why are women not allowed to do this? And the idea is not to degrade women. It's to properly display what Christ's role is as our husband. Do we understand that? Because it's really important. The, the Bible is not a sexist book, but it is a significant book. And, and, and we're not going to ignore commandments in the Bible, and we're not going to ignore hard verses in the Bible in the name of, oh, well, I don't get that. It doesn't make me feel good, so we're not going to get into it. You know, I, I have a, a very strong passion on my heart that we don't ignore verses 
uh, like like Second Corinthians, well, Second and First Corinthians actually, where it talks about, hey, you know what? Don't let women speak in church. And it's like, okay, well, how do I reconcile that? With these places in the New Testament, I see women prophesying, women speaking in church. Priscilla and Aquila, husband and wife, are teaching other teachers. They, they have a home church in their house. You know, there's, there's one scripture where it says that someone was teaching, and Priscilla and Aquila, they, they took this person aside and explained the gospel. It says, more completely to the person. And yet women aren't allowed to speak in the church, I, so we're missing something. And so I, I, I don't want to hide from these verses, I want to actually address them. And so today, I, I kind of want to give us the setup for understanding, hey, when you encounter hard scriptures, here is the lens you need to approach them from, okay? So if, if we're doing anything today, we're providing the lens through which we're to understand God's commands to the New Testament church, to women, to men. We, we, we have to understand what he's getting at, so that we can understand, hey, his heart is to love us. I was, I was reading Isaiah the other day, and, and it's incredible. He's talking about, man, uh, you know, Israel has abandoned me. They, they continually seek other gods, so here's what I'm going to do, and then gives one of the most powerful prophecies about what Jesus is going to do. And you go, okay, so hold on. So God's response to our sin is to send his son. So often we read books like Isaiah, and we go, oh, well, God's clearly saying, hey, I'm going to, you know, dash your children against a stone. Me and Nicole talked about that the other day. You see words like that and you go, man, I'm, God, I don't really understand what you're saying here because I thought you were a God of love and I'm seeing these things I don't understand. And, and so I'm going to frame this up very, very briefly for us and then we'll, we'll get specifically into Jesus. Now, when you see a scripture that talks about the wrath of God, it's important that we don't downplay that. I, there, there's a phenomenal uh, movie, I, I won't mention the name, but it, it downplays the wrath of God and it they do a great job of capturing the love of God, but they downplay this wrath thing. And look, any good parent <laughs> knows what this word wrath means. And here's what it means. It means if you were to take winter, my daughter, if you, were, if you were to take my daughter and you were to abuse her and you were to take advantage of her, and then I had the opportunity later to do something about it, that's what God's wrath is. And so we need to understand, okay, so, so if someone took my daughter and they said, hey, you know, here, here's what's going to happen. We're, 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 we're going to take advantage of her. We're going to abuse her. You know, you think about the most despicable people in this world. They're what? They're child abusers. And all of us are on the same page that there is nothing worse. There, there's no worse thing you can do than to prey on the innocence of a child. And so when you see God's wrath pop up in the Bible, it's important that we understand he's dealing with child abusers. He's dealing with an enemy who would prey on the innocence of, those, of Adam and Eve in the garden, of children, of me and you. So when you see the wrath of God, you're, you're, even on people, you're seeing people who, though they know there's a better way to live, are choosing to lead his kids astray. And so we have to understand, okay, so, so God is loving. It is 100% his desire that we would connect with him, we would love him, we would fall in love with him, all of those things. But when we see those harder verses, we, ha we have to understand, hey, look, there's a reason behind this. And like any good parent would punish an enemy for abusing their child, our God is a good parent. Similarly, Jesus is a good husband, and he desires a bride who would seek him fully. And so now we come to this idea of mimic. How do we know what it means to seek Jesus? I, I really believe we find this in the Old Testament. What, what, one thing I'll mention briefly is a, a lot of the commands to women are about sanitary reasons in the Old Testament. Most of that has been dealt with. Obviously, women still do have a cycle for, for pregnancy and those things, and that's important. But, but it's important to know, hey, women were kind of ostracized in many ways just because we had no good way to deal with the sanitary things that come along with being a woman, with having a cycle. And, and disease was carried in the blood. We had no way, good way of dealing with the blood or dealing with the diseases that came from the blood. And so the only conclusion to, to not pass diseases would be, hey, we need to separate women during this time that these diseases can be spread. Okay, that's the entire idea behind uh, women uh, only, you know, it's kind of funny that the only week in which a woman was not considered ceremonially, cer I, I can't, yeah, see, you did it too. Ceremonially, there it is, <laughs> unclean was the week of their ovulation, which is kind of funny. 
The week before they have their period and the week after they have their period, they're considered unclean, and obviously the week of their period. And so you have to understand, hey, God's desire is still that we would be fruitful and multiply, that women could still, you know, obviously when a woman gets pregnant, she no longer cycles, and so she can be in community. That's, that's another important thing to understand is, hey, a, a big reason why God wanted women to be fruitful and multiply was so they could be in the community more. I think so often we go, oh, well, God just wants us to be pregnant, and, you know, women are just... You know, these things that just carry around babies. It's like, no, like they do carry around babies, but there's more to it than that. There's more to what Jesus is trying to paint for us than so often what we see. And so my idea for, okay, so God, how, how do I, how have I gotten to this place where I believe, okay, God has given us commands to mirror what he desires in the heavenly realm. How did I get to this place? Hebrews 9, 23 through 27 is, is kind of what started me thinking about this. Starting in verse 23, it says this, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands uh, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again as the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that is not their own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the accumulation of the ages to do away with sin by sacrificing himself. So, I read this verse and what really caught my eye was, hey, look, Jesus went into heaven, but the Holy of Holies was, was just a copy, okay? So on earth, we had the temple, we had the place where the high priest went, but that was a copy of the heavenly version, okay? And so, listen, I'm going to make a statement, and I'll, I want us to be on the same page. This is so much less important than your relationship with Jesus, and here's how I know. Because your relationship with Jesus was present before he had to sacrifice to bring you back into it. Okay, so in the garden, there was no sacrificial system. There was no, hey, we have to build up to getting in God's presence. We were just in God's presence. Okay, so he values relationship with you, and his sacrifice was to the end of being in relationship with you. And if he was so intentional that he would give us, uh, you know, there were, I believe it's over 200 prophecies about Jesus. Over 200 prophecies about Jesus that would describe uh, the way he would live and the way he would die don't you think he would maybe describe a little bit about how he wants us to relate with him? Like, don't you think if, if he, he took the heavenly sacrifice and said, hey, we're going to mimic what Jesus is going to do on earth daily with these sacrifices, don't you think the relationship he was aiming at the entire time would be mirrored in the same manner? Wouldn't that make sense? A God who, who, who wants to teach us how to relate with him? And so today, more than anything in the world, if I could convince you to do one thing, it's when you read the Bible and read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, so often we skip it because it's kind of harder to read and we'll jump around to just the stories and not read the commands. Listen, when you miss the commands, you miss what God is trying to describe on how to relate with him. Okay, so don't skip segments of the Bible. The vast majority of what I learn these days from the Bible is from reading those parts most people skip over. Because, because God's actually trying to tell us something with those things. It's not, it's not designed to be skipped over. And so if I can encourage you in one thing to walk away with it, it's, it's read the Old Testament through the lens of God is trying to connect with me. So how is he doing that through this? And that comes to this idea of heavenly marriage. You know, we're, we're, we're going to be married to Jesus. We've talked about uh, Revelation 19 quite a bit. Uh, it was probably six months ago that we talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb and that the eventual goal is uh, that we would not only be at a table with the Lord, but more importantly, we would, we would be in relationship with the Lord at that table. And so the day that he defeats the enemy, he, he casts the enemy into hell, and he comes to dinner. Who's he coming to dinner with? Me. And we need to make that personal. God is coming to dinner with me on the most triumphant day in history. He's, he's going to sit down with me at the table. The next, the next thought I want to I share with us is this idea that, that God wants to show you off. 
You know, I don't, I don't know how many of us recently have read the description of, of the new Jerusalem that the Bible lays out, but it's really cool because it's almost like God's showing off on our behalf. He says, I don't even need a light. My, my presence alone will be the light for that city. The reason that that works, because, you know, we understand light as like, hey, if there's a wall in the way, you can't see that light, right? But heaven is going to be completely uh, enamored and, and surrounded and pretty much it's all going to be made up of these beautiful reflective gems. And so everywhere you go, God's glory is going to be reflected around you. So it's really, really beautiful. But, but something cool in, in Revelation 21 so we're basically at the end of the Bible. There's this idea, and it's uh, John is talking, and it said, Then one of the seven angels holding the seven bowls full of seven final plagues spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. I think it's cool that, that of all the beauty in heaven, he says, Hey, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you the bride. It goes on to describe all of heaven. That's, that's what comes next in, in Revelation 21. It, it describes the jaspers and the, and the onyx and the beautiful stones that are going to be there. But, but what, it, what was on God's heart that we would see first? The bride. And so I, I, I really want to frame for us today that we as the bride are like, God can't stop thinking about us. He can't stop talking about us. So we, we said last week, Jesus and the Holy Spirit the whole time are, are talking with God. They're interceding on our behalf. They're, they're telling God, hey, you, you got to meet this guy. You, you got to interact with him. You got to get to know him. I believe that this is why divorce is, is, is such a heartbreaker for the Lord. You know, I've, I've had this conversation many times and uh, I, I've come to one conclusion about it, which is uh, divorce is not God's recipe or, or God's solution for a bad marriage. Now, listen, there, there are certainly times when divorce is necessary. I, I, I in no way want to, to downplay those. Those are certainly things. I've had people bring up with me uh, uh, plenty of times uh, Matthew 19, 6, which I'm going to read here in just a second, which says, hey, you know what? It's not true that God's against divorce because uh, Moses allowed us to give a certificate of divorce. And Jesus said, hey, if, if there's adultery, then you're not committing adultery by divorcing them. But that's not the whole verse. Okay, so we're going to read the whole thing. But what we're going to understand it in this sense, okay, is that in the garden, we were with God and then we were separated from God. Very simple, okay? What happened when we were separated is pain entered into the world. So if you've ever been heartbroken, if you've ever been dating someone and then broken up with that person, you understand what kind of pain I'm talking about. The pain where there's no rational way to explain it, the pain where it won't go away, where it's so excruciating, you're like, I don't even understand why this exists, okay? Because it wasn't supposed to, okay? Like, pain is what happens when you break a good thing. Pain is what occurs when there's a perfect existence, when, when, when God has created you to feel all these intensely wonderful things, and then you uh, disfigure how it is that you're supposed to experience those things. When you disfigure your relationship, pain occurs. And, and so why is pain so excruciating? Because you were never meant to experience it. We were never meant to experience pain. I believe that this is is Jesus' uh, position on divorce. You know, it's so interesting to me. So often uh, we, we can over-religify uh, uh, the Bible and, and we can make it so big and grandiose, but I, I want to be very simple for a minute. I'm going to read this verse, and, and it's important that we understand, hey, God just wanted to be in relationship with us. So Matthew 19, 6 through 8 says this, So they are no longer two but one flesh, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command us to give her a certificate of divorce to put her away? And Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. You know, from the beginning, God never meant for us to be separated from him. 
He, he never meant for that to happen. And, and so, look, if, if we're going to mirror what the heavenly version is supposed to be like, which is where we're in perfect relationship with God, then, hey, we, we better start understanding that the commands he's giving us for our marriage are for the benefit of us learning to, to, to represent and relate with him. And, and from the beginning, we were never supposed to get divorced. You know what happened in the garden? We got a divorce. We broke off our engagement. Because look, our, our, our wedding ceremony was, was Jesus on the cross. And that's, that's kind of the flow of events. If, if you look at Jesus' life and really our love story with God, when Jesus comes down and starts telling about us about how much he loves us and then he, he does the, the ultimate act of love, he dies for us, that was, that was essentially us getting married. And then we're, we're, we're going to go to heaven Soon, well, soon in terms of eternity. And, and when we go to heaven, we're going to have the marriage feast of the Lamb where we actually get to celebrate being, being joined together with Him. But the idea here is, is, is very, very simple. Look, it was always Jesus' and Jesus's intention to be with us forever. So I, I want to point something out to us. Uh, really quickly, if I can find it in my notes here. So we're better off than we were at the garden. And I kind of want us to, to think about this for just a minute. So you see, in the garden, we were what? We were, we were friends with God, right? Can anybody, everybody agree there? We walked with him in the garden, but, but we weren't necessarily his kids at the time. And we weren't necessarily married with Jesus. I don't see that anywhere in the, in the garden. And, and so when I think about how we relate with God, and, and I go back to the garden, I go, okay, so, so in the garden, we were friends with God, and that was great, and, and we want to get back to that. I'm not saying we don't want to get back to that, but if I look at where we are now, I, I would venture to say that we're better off. And here's why. Because God, when he saw that we had disfigured his image, he said, okay, so, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I, I, I'm... I'm going to bring them back into relationship with me, but I'm going to do it by the rules that I've established. I'm not going to break my own rules. I'm, I'm going to work within my own rules. And, and the only person that I can send to pay this price is my son. But by definition, something is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. And so if I'm the only one who can fix this problem, and it's going to take my blood to cover the cost, then not only are they going to be my creation, now they're going to be as valuable as me. Okay? Are, are, are we all okay with that so far? Okay, so, so we're worth the blood of Jesus. We're worth what someone's willing to pay for us. And so we're, we're of the same value as Jesus. Why? Because God of the universe said so. He determined our value. Okay, but it, it gets a little better than that. Okay, so, so he paid for us so that we could be adopted into God's family. We're all familiar with that language. You know, we're, we're, we're the adopted children of God and we're co-heirs with Christ. You know something? I, I don't believe we would have been co-heirs with Christ had, not sin, had sin not come into the world. Now, I do believe we would have gotten married to Jesus, okay? And, and I'll read you a verse for that in, in a minute. But, but the fact that we're adopted into God's family, that never would have needed to take place, okay? Because we were already in relationship with God. But since he had to come and save us, Jesus had to humble himself to the point where he said, okay, I will not be alone, the lone heir of God anymore. They get to be heirs with God as well. Can you imagine the humility of God Almighty saying, I won't be the only one anymore. I won't be the only one who's this valuable anymore. I think so often we breeze over this idea, but how phenomenal is it that God Almighty looked down and so loved us that he said, I will make you of the same value as myself so that you might choose me. Like that is an unbelievable kind of love. So many of us have no way of understanding. Romans 8.17 is what calls us co-heirs with Christ. I don't, I don't say that lightly. It kind of makes me a little uncomfortable. And I go, I'm, I'm of the same value as God Almighty. 
Like it, it's like, man, I don't, <laughs> it, it scares you a little bit. You're like, am I going to get struck by lightning? Like, but you're of the same value as God Almighty. You are. The next one I, I, I want to bring up to us is, is, is not only that, but look, God is, God is not just making you into a, a, a son. He's, he's making you new. Romans, or I'm sorry, Revelation 21. So we read verse 9 earlier. We're going to jump back a couple verses. Revelation 5, 6, it says this. And the one seated upon the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these words, for they are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give freely to drink from the water of life. And to the one who overcomes, he shall inherit all these things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So no longer just friend, son. Okay, so we're better off than we were. We're better off. Now, I want to point a couple things out. And we're, we're going to talk quite a bit next week about uh, uh, the, the build-up to Jesus' sacrifice. I want, I want to talk about understanding exactly what occurred, okay? So we, we, we said last week, okay, so we disfigured the image of God by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so we broke the image. We no longer properly represented God. Okay, and since we didn't properly represent him, his response was what? To send his son down to die for us. Okay, so everyone agrees on that. Every single one of us gets that idea. Here's what so often we breeze over. I've heard this put two ways. Both ways are wrong. The first way is uh, 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 God will not look on sin. God is so holy that he won't look on sin. That comes from a verse uh, in Habakkuk. Did you know that verse actually says, God, you're so ho holy, why would you look on sin, yet you still look on my sins? Okay, so that idea, literally the verse itself explains itself, and it says, no, God does look on our sins. He so loves us that he would still look at our sins. But, but the, the other way that I hear, hear this put is, okay, so uh, on the cross, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then they go, oh, well, you know what? God, God didn't actually leave Jesus. He was with Jesus more in that moment than any other moment. And it's like kind of a nice thought, but it's like, it's exactly wrong. Like the entire price Jesus had to pay was, was the disconnection from God. Jesus had to pay for the fact we were disconnected from God, so he had to be disconnected from God. And, and, and so what does this mean? Okay, for, for the first time in all eternity, the Son and the Father are not connected, okay? So, so not only did the Son lay down divinity to come as a man, okay? So, so often we don't give him credit for this. Jesus had all of the power and all of existence, yet laid it down to honor your ability to choose. He could have easily snapped his fingers and undid what you had done. Easily. He could have gone, no, no, no. They, they messed up. They made the wrong choice. I'll undo that. But no, he, he, he honored your decision and said, okay, even though you chose that, I'll still make a way for you to come back into relationship with me, okay? So, so Jesus came down as a man, laid down divinity, and so the Trinity was changed. So it was God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they were all divine. They all had the power of God, yet Jesus lays it down, becomes a man, and then, and then it's disfigured even further. Now, now, here's why I believe Jesus actually had to physically die on the cross, I don't believe he had to physically die for anything other than to show us how we would be completely reconnected to God. Because we, we've talked so many times that, that, hey, look, when the Bible talks about death, you know, in the garden, it says, on the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. Well, they didn't die physically that day. They were put out of God's presence that day. The two times Jesus raises people from the dead, it was a little girl and it was Lazarus. Both times he says, they're not dead, they're asleep. And everybody's kind of like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And he's like, okay, so in the, in the case of Lazarus, he said, no, he's actually like physically dead, I'm gonna go raise him. In the case of the little girl, they laughed at him and he sent him out and then he raised her from the dead. So why would Jesus say they're not dead, they're asleep when they're obviously dead? It's because look, the, the, the price Jesus had to pay was separation from God. He didn't, it wasn't this physical death thing. Peter actually talks about, he talks about the first death and the second death, okay? 
that the first death is physically, the second death would be spiritual separation from God. It's, it's eternity in hell. That's the second death. It's the death where you no longer have the opportunity to be in relationship with God. That's, that's what real death is. And so on the cross, when Jesus suffers like we needed to suffer and then is separated from God for the first time in eternity, he paid that portion of the price. But he still died physically. He still gave up his spirit on that cross. And, and I've often wondered, I've wondered why. Because the price was separation from God. That's what needed to be paid. And yet he died physically. That, that, it doesn't make any sense to me. But then, then he framed it for me in this way. He said, I died to show you the way to get rid of the sins that you're stuck in even after you're saved. And, and what I mean by that is this. I died so that I would go down to hell and I would take the keys to death and hell. Okay, so, so he dies, he goes down, he takes the keys to death and hell and goes, presents himself before the Father and forever pins those to the cross and says, no longer do those have any power. I wish I would have grabbed the verse, but it's in Revelation. It says, oh, uh, oh death, where is your sting, right? So, so he took the power of those, okay? So why do we have to die physically? Because the knowledge of those things is still in our heads. Because even though we're saved, we all agree we're saved in this room. We've all been saved, but that knowledge didn't just pop out of our heads. We, we still know what good and evil is. But listen, my Bible says that there, there's going to be no more pain in heaven. There's going to be no more suffering in heaven. There won't even be a memory of it. Okay, so at what point am I saved but suffering and then I'm no longer suffering and I'm just saved? At what point does that happen? When we die. When we die, we go from suffering to no longer suffering. Still saved, but suffering and then no longer suffering. So when does it happen? It happens when you die. Okay, so, so why did Jesus die? He died to get rid of death and sin. Okay, why do we have to die physically? To get rid of death and sin. We just get rid of the, our memory of it, okay? Are we okay with that? Is everybody understanding? I'm going to read us a couple verses to show you what I mean. So, so we have to die physically. I, I got this idea from 1 Peter 1.4. It says, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ has made known to me. So, 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 so he knows, hey, I'm going to put off my body. Jesus was clear, I, I, I got to put off this body. Now listen, when you get to heaven, you get a new body. Listen, when Jesus rose from the grave, he was in a glorified body. Okay, that's why he was walking around and people weren't recognizing him. And he's like walking through walls and stuff. And you're like, why weren't you doing this before? This would have been so much cooler. Well, it's because he had picked up divinity again, okay? He, he, okay, when he raises from the dead, he's fully God again. Like, not just in personality, like in power, okay? So during his life, everything he did was by the Holy Spirit. Every single thing he did. But, 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 but then, what does he do? He, he dies, he resurrects, and then he's going around doing all kinds of stuff. He's teleporting, and he's like here, and then he's 40 miles away, like in the same paragraph, and you're like, what are you doing, Jesus? Like, he didn't do this before. And it's because he had, he had, he had picked up divinity again. He, he got a new body. Similarly, we, because remember, we're mirroring Jesus. We get a new body when we die, and this body doesn't have the knowledge of good and evil. Now, now here's the important thing, is, is if, if, if you're tracking with me, which, which I know this is kind of a lot, but if you're tracking, you, you would ask the question, you go, okay, so in the garden, we were perfect and we screwed it up. So what's going to stop us from screwing it up again? Okay? I'd say that's a fair question. Okay? What, what would stop us from disfiguring the image of God again? And, and here's what I truly believe. I believe that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or, I'm sorry, the tree of life. I, I, I really do. I believe that that is the tree of life. And I'll read to you why I believe that. First off, Peter tells us that the angels have sinned. Okay? The demons, I should say. I want to be clear about that. That the demons have sinned, okay? Why is that important? Because when they sinned, they were still eternal beings, okay? Like all of us agree, the demons have been living for a long time and they're still living, okay? So, so listen, sin is not what made our physical bodies start deteriorating, okay? They were always temporary. 
Why do I say that? Okay, because in the garden, God goes, okay, they've sinned. I'm going to put them out so they don't eat from the tree of life and live forever in a fallen state. Okay, so, so sin doesn't make us not eternal anymore. Sin just messes us up. Okay, so, so in the garden, so many of us have never thought about this. In the garden, God's first order of business was to ensure that if we were to not choose him, he could still fix it. Why is it that we die physically? Why is it that we don't live forever physically? We're, we're made in the image and likeness of God, right? It was so that he could still fix it. And so he gave them the right in the garden. He said, hey, if, if you want to eat from, from the tree of life, do it. Get you some. Just don't, don't eat from this, this tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's no good for you. It, it's it's going to mess you up. It's no good, but... But how good is God that he made sure he could still fix it? Okay? So the angel sent, it literally says, I, I, I saw the verse and I was like, that's exactly what I needed. And Peter, it says, hey, that the, the angels have sinned. Okay, so sin's not the issue. Sin's not what makes you die physically. We, we have to die physically to get rid of the knowledge of good and evil so that what, what, what was once natural... What was once innocent can be natural and innocent again. And so Jesus came down and he mirrored. He said, hey, here's what it's going to take for you to come back into relationship. And just as when I died, I took care of death and hell. When you die, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's done. First John 114, I love this verse so much. It says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. I don't, I don't know if you've ever read that translation before. That's actually uh, the tree of life. So it's as accurate as you can possibly get. Number one is tree of life. Number two is ESV. So if you've ever wondered what the most accurate Bible is, it's not like King James or New King James. It's, it's ESV is number two. It was for the longest time, number one in 2014, the tree of life version came out which inserts Hebrew words whenever an English word won't do the trick. And so it's, it's the number one most accurate version. And it says this word tabernacled. I love this word. And you go, okay, why, why tabernacled? Everyone else's translation says dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But this one says tabernacled. Why is that important? Does anybody know what the tabernacle was? It was the tent that traveled with the children of Israel when they were in Egypt for 40 years. It was where God's presence was housed. Okay, so it was the temple before the temple. That's what the tabernacle was, okay? So why is it important that God uses the word tabernacle instead of dwell? Because he's saying, in the same way that I was present with you in the Old Testament and you felt my presence every day, I was a cloud by day and I was fire by night. In the same way, Jesus is going to come down and he is going to be my presence in your life. And yet we see this word dwell and it's like, man, that's not nearly as special. Like it's cool. God dwelt among us, but no, no, no. He, he tabernacled. He made his home among us. What's, what, what's even more incredible about this is, is a physical body was, was not God's default, okay? You know, you, you hear descriptions of him and the earth is his footstool and and he established, he, he drew a line across the earth and established the, the equator is what it's talking about. And you're like, man, that's pretty incredible. But okay, but listen, what we wear, our bodies are not God's default. Okay, he's so much greater than that. Now, now he chose for Jesus to come in that form to relate with us. But, but when it says this word tabernacle, I want you to think about it this way. I have chosen to make what is not my home the place where I will reside so that you can relate with me. I really believe that this is Jesus in principle. I have chosen to become relatable to you so that you will see me and maybe you'll choose me. Do you know what the sun represents? The, the sun in the Trinity, Jesus, the sun, represents God's attempt to help us relate. Today, I, I so desire that we see Jesus with the love that he has for us. 
So with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to close your eyes for just a minute and, and we're going to pray. And I know that there was, there was a lot today, but I want to focus on this one thing as, as we close, which is with all of the things that Jesus did and with, <laughs> with all the hoops he had to jump through, there was one person on his mind. There, there, there was one thing on his mind. And it was relationship with you. And at every point where he could have made a different decision or broken his own rules, he said, no, I'm, I'm going to honor the fact that they chose something else, but I'm going to give them the opportunity to come back in relationship with me. So God, right now, we just pray. We pray that we would get, God, a revelation of you. That we would start to understand on a deep level that you love us with such a ridiculous love, God, that you would uh, disfigure yourself so that we could relate with you. God, that you would wrap yourself in flesh and you would, God, you would be with us. So I pray right now that we would just dive into you, God. We would understand your love. And we would understand, God, what you did to save us. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. All right. And breathe. I know that that was a lot, and I, 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 I certainly want us all to, to understand these things. So, um, you know, if you, if you need me to break that down again sometime, if you're like, Matthew, that was way too much, you need to do that in like five weeks, that's fine. I'm completely fine to do that. Uh, again, I, I, I do my best to communicate these things in, in like 30 minutes, and it's taken me like a whole bunch of years to learn it. And so um, with that in mind, I would encourage you, go home and read it. Go home and read all the verses I'm talking about. You know, you have Isaiah saying you get the tree of life in heaven. That's where the tree of life is. Have you ever wondered, like, where is the tree of life? It's in heaven. It says that God's going to give us access to drink from the waters of life. I don't know what that means. I just know that they say life, and that sounds great. So go and read about it. Go and experience the things that he wants to show us. So uh, with that said, we're going to finish up like we do every week uh, with testimony time. Uh, so if God's been doing something in your life, we want to hear about it. One, one cool thing for me um, was me and Winter were just kind of hanging out, just the two of us, the past few days. Um, and there was a really cool moment. Yesterday we were hanging out and uh, I was sitting on the couch and just had such an overwhelming amount of love for her. And I was just sitting there like with my daughter and it's like, that's a feeling right there. And so I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go on a date. And so we went to Chili's and it was great. And it was so much fun to just get to go and just be with her. And it, it was amazing. And so I'm, I'm just going to leave that there. It was, it was awesome. So that's my testimony. I just love my daughter. So anybody else? Okay. Well, then we'll pray and we'll go. God, we love you. And we thank you. And we just pray right now, uh, God, that we would just see you in our daily lives. God, we would seize the opportunities in front of us to just enjoy what you have made. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I was on a delivery call, but oh. I just wanted to um, lay hands and pray for my mom. Um, she recently got a mammogram and they found some things. And so hopefully it's not cancer, so everything's okay. But I know that there's power and prayer and healing and laying of hands. So I just wanted to do that for her today. Yeah. Let's do it. You're welcome. Here, I'll go in the back. I'm really blocking the way here. Okay. Thank you all. The whole space. All right. Lord, I just love you, and I just thank you for my mom, God, and just all the miracles 
physically, spiritually, just everything that you've done in her life and all the things that you want to continue to do, Lord. And I just pray that this will be another testimony of your goodness and you just protecting her and um, keeping her under your wing, Father God. I just pray that in Jesus' name you would remove um, the abnormal findings right now, Lord, that your healing power would just come over her body and take authority and make everything the way that you designed and created it to be. In Jesus' mighty name. And Jesus, we just pray healing over Cindy's body right now. And we say uh, from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, God, that you would just touch uh, every part of her and bring it back into alignment with your original design, God. And just that there is uh, nothing that's allowed to, to attack her body. We rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And we just declare a good report from the doctors. Um, and, and, and we say good things over her body in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.